Side Hustle Show 195, How Book Marketing Really Works, Tips from a Six-Figure Self-Published Author. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. What's up, what's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. Happy to have you with me today as it's launch week for my new book, Buy Buttons. You can learn more and grab your copy at buybuttonsbook.com. Today's conversation rounds out our Buy Buttons theme for the month, which has been all about the power of tapping into pre-existing audiences of buyers. And this one actually stemmed from an email I got a few weeks ago. So last month, I compiled a roundup post with book launch and book marketing tips from 25 authors which I thought had some really good stuff in there. I'll link that up in the show notes. When I sent out my newsletter about it, one reader wrote back and basically said, hey, you know what? All of that is cute, but let me know if you want me to show you how it really works. That reader was Adam Hoagie, a full-time self-published author with more than 100 titles to his name. He's distributed more than 2 million books on the Amazon platform using his free and paid launch strategies, and he's built a healthy six-figure income from author royalties. So, of course, I invited him on to walk me through his business and share his tips for aspiring and side-hustling writers. Stick around to hear Adam's advice for getting your uh, book pages set up for high conversions, how he turns readers and even just Amazon browsers into subscribers, and his favorite ways to drive traffic and spike sales, both for launches and to breathe new life into existing titles. Notes, links, and a free PDF highlight reel from this conversation are at sidehustlenation.com slash Adam. Before we dive in, let me take a moment to thank today's sponsor, which is designcrowd.com. Submit your design project on designcrowd and let dozens of creative designers compete for your business. I just tested it out for my book cover, for the Buy Buttons book cover, and I'm loving the result. Visit designcrowd.com slash hustle or use promo code hustle to get up to $100 off your next design project. I'll tell you a little bit more about my Design Crowd experience, plus my top takeaways from this chat with Adam after the interview. Ready? Uh, let's do it. A few years ago, I had gone through a medical condition that kind of forced me to retire early, and I had to spend a few years at home with the kids being a stay-at-home dad. Long story short, I had a lot of downtime. There's a book I had wanted to write for years, so it gave me that opportunity, and I heard about the Kindle platform, so I went ahead and put it out there. And what book was that? That one was called The Power and Passion. Since then, I've taken it out of print to edit it further and give it more details. Okay. That was title number one. And so this is like springtime of 2013? Yes, April. Okay. And your health has improved, it sounds like? Oh, yeah. Quite a bit. Okay. (laughs) So staying home, writing, using this kind of unfortunate thing and trying to turn it into a positive, making lemonade out of it. What happened next? You know, a lot of people will tell the story, hey, I launched the book and, you know, I'm expecting this flood of orders and three people bought it. Did you have a similar thing or was this a hit right out of the gate? Oh, no, it was not a hit. In fact, I wasn't expecting a hit per se. I was just trying to get a message out there and maybe make a little bit of extra money for my family. We really had a lot of need at the time. So, I mean, that's kind of how my side hustle journey began, I guess you could say. But you know, when I put it out there, that first month it had only done $50 worth of business. So I mean, you can't ever expect something to just take off in the beginning. It's, it's not realistic, but everything can be strategically built through time into a reasonable income. Absolutely. I remember my first royalty check. It was right around that $50 mark. It was like $47.42 or something like that. Right. Okay. So the book is out there. Now, are you saying, okay, I can make $50 from this one book. I'm, I need to build out a portfolio or because now you've got a hundred books to your name, which I think is crazy, a crazy amount of content production. So what happens next over the next few months? Well, I thought it would work a little bit if I just put a few more out. I wasn't really doing it for money at the time. I was just kind of doing it to get a message out. I was a preacher for years, and I mean, that's what I'm passionate about. That's what I was doing. But it continued to work, like I was saying, just kind of on this slow strategic build. And the income continually you know, increased, and I began realizing, you know, hey, there's something here. And it started to kind of turn into a competition with my wife, I just kind of teasingly, like, hey, you know, if I keep on putting out this many books, maybe I could actually match your income one day. Okay, and okay. <laughs> she took me up on that because she said, you know what, when you match my income, let me come home. And I said, okay. I'm here. quitting. <laughs> okay, how long did it take to get to that point? What was your content production schedule? Like, Were you just like sitting down and writing all day while the kids are at school? 
Well, no, my kids were young, so I would take care of them, and they were toddlers. So okay. while during their naps, I'd write, and while they're sleeping, I'd write. Just any opportunity I had during any downtime or anything, I would write and write. I tried to shoot for about 1,000 to 3,000 words a day. It'd be a really lucky day if I could get that high. But okay. I mean, I knew the material, so it was easy for me to write more words. It's not like that for fiction for me. It's difficult to crank out 1,000 words in a day with fiction. But long story short, yeah, I just I continued to write. And I probably was doing about oh two to three books a month for a while. They, they were shorter, wow. maybe about, I'd say about 15,000 words. Okay, 15,000 word book putting out a couple of those every month. And we should note that Adam's writing primarily in the religion niche or the religion space, which is one of the most competitive categories on Amazon. You're on this mission to replace your wife's income. Tell me about that. I assume you got there and I know she's at home now. So what's going on there? <laughs> well, I'd say, I think it was, I don't have the exact math in my head. It was six or eight months later. In September, I had a paycheck of $1,800. It was kind of an all-time high for me. And okay. I continued building it out, but I began realizing that I was kind of doing some things wrong with connecting on the algorithm on Amazon. There were better ways to get more visibility and I should have had a better promotion strategy. And I was just starting to learn these things as I was going along. And when I started putting those elements together in October, I had this tremendous burst of sales where I had sold $14,000 worth of books. Wow. And by December, I had been cranking out almost $40,000 worth. And for a, a short period of time, I had outsold Killing Jesus by Bill O'Reilly. Obviously, he had by far outsold me when he hit the New York Times. But <laughs> right when he put it out, I had that little bit of bragging right that I got ahead of him for just a little bit in the top 100. Okay. What were those tweaks that you made? And we should say that even at $1,800 a month, probably in the top 10% of self-published authors on Amazon, but to explode that up to 14,000, to almost 10x that in a month, I'm curious what you did to crank up that volume. One thing someone has to understand is that the algorithm on Amazon is continuously being tweaked and changed. And if you can keep up with that, that's exactly what you need to do to stay on top. And so at that time, when you would put all the promotions you could into one day and then try to prop your ranks up for maybe about three, four, or five days afterward, you would have a, a really steady burst on the algorithm of visibility. And so that helps, except there's a few things with your book that you need to focus on to help convert those sales. Things like how well designed your cover is, how well the title connects with the genre, with your target audience. And it especially helps if you've got, you know, a keyword well woven into it. I'm not saying to keyword stuff. You want it to be a good title. Just having a cleverly woven keyword in there, having a good description. But the description shouldn't describe the book. It needs to just it steal their attention away. It has to hook them so they ask themselves, you know, you don't want them to, to leave the room saying, hmm, that was interesting. You want them to say, oh my gosh, I have to know what happens next. So they open your book and the same thing with the sample. I tried to make it as compelling as possible. And I found that those few tweaks had helped considerably, especially when I had discovered that the keywords played a tremendous role in my visibility. So I made sure that my keywords were tested and had more traffic to them. So how many titles did you have at this point? Do you remember? Don't remember on hand, but I think it was close to 230-ish. Oh, geez. Okay. And did you go back and redo the cover art for those? I did. Okay. In the beginning, how I did it was I didn't have a lot of money. So I went to Fiverr.com and I wasn't trusting the quality I was getting from them. So I talked with one of the buyers. He did some decent work with some of the fonts. So I asked, hey, you know, where do you go for your images? And he told me it was Big Stock Photo. Okay. So that works like Shutterstock. So I went to Big Stock Photo. I found the images that I wanted him to use. I handed them to him and he just put the font on there and kind of make a couple tweaks. And in that way, I was able to make my covers for just pennies on the dollar look a whole lot better. Okay. That was the time frame when I started doing that with my covers. Otherwise, in the very beginning, my first one, I spent a lot of money on and I didn't make that money back for months. And the second one, I didn't have any money. So my wife, she's good at scrapbooking. So she scrapbooked a page and we scanned it in on our scanner and I went and tried to clip it out and put it on. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, but that one ended up outselling the other book. So that told me, wow, you know, maybe there's something here. Maybe I don't need to be spending so much on the cover. Maybe I just need to focus on the quality, the attention to the quality there. 
Okay, that's an interesting hack. And, and you make a good point on the description. Like that's always the last thing, at least that I write when I'm hitting publish. And by the time I'm to that point, I'm almost, I just want to hit the button. I just wanted to get it out to the world. That's kind of your 4,000 characters, however much they give you, your 4,000 character sales pitch of like, look, why you need this book in your life. Right. Did you have any formula that you found works or what are you really trying to do in that description text to hook somebody in? Yeah, it's such a big one. I have to agree with you. Those are my last things that I write and it tends to be the hardest. I just wrote the book. I know what it's about. I'm the author, but why do I struggle at the description? I don't know. Yeah. And trying to like boil it down to the most, yeah, it's, it's a big job. Right. The most helpful little things are. And so what happens is authors, we have a tendency to try to just describe the book. We're trying to describe it to ourselves to figure out, okay, well, if I were meeting with someone, they want to know what it's about. And you loosely describe it on there. And that's not what you want to do. Even though it's named description, I learned to spend hours on it if I had to, to make sure that it, it hooked. And I mean, my formula really is sometimes I try to catch them with the first sentence and then something at the very end. And I try it with a nonfiction. I try to make them see why they need it, what they need and compare it with what they're looking for, and then basically explain how this book is everything and more, you know, all of that and more. Okay. But the only thing that I could really, if I could give a piece of advice, it's hook, hook, hook them with a description. It's the first thing they'll ever read from you. It needs to be the best thing you've ever written. All right, we'll link up some of your books so you can people can go check out some of Adam's descriptions that he's got on there as good examples of what to work with. Now, you mentioned the keyword strategy. Can you tell me a little bit about what you were doing to get more strategic about the keywords you were focusing on? Sure. Well, it's difficult to explain it in one sitting, but in a nutshell, if you go onto Amazon.com and, and you type in basically the keywords that you would think, you know, the keyword phrases, the individual words that you think your target audience would type in to find your book, you can go through the list of those right there on the Amazon page and see how high the sales ranks are of those books. If on the first page, there's one or two that are ranked highly, but everything else is below 100,000, or, or excuse me, I should it's worked backward with the sales rank, above 100,000. So you're seeing ranks at 100, 200, 300,000. That keyword is not getting traffic. But if you see that several of those books or half of them are at 20,000 or 10,000 or higher or better, then that says to you there is traffic to that keyword and it could be a lot of traffic. And another tip that I'd put out there is if you look at the bestseller lists, your competitors who are on the top, you'll notice that they are trying to weave a keyword in there. So let's say with my religious books, I had learned in the beginning that one of the things they were weaving in there was the word prayer or prayer book. And so I began okay. targeting that. And I end up finding out more keywords to target. And it's good to have a broad base, especially as you're starting to write more because you don't want all your books targeting the same thing or you're competing with yourself. Okay. So I'm going on Amazon. So I'm looking at kind of the first keyword that comes to mind. Like I'm going to write a book about skydiving or something. And then, so I'm going to look at the top five results that show up and look at their sales rank. And on Amazon, the lower the number, the better, the more copies that they're selling. And then looking at kind of the suggested search terms that pop up when I type in skydiving as well? Yes, absolutely. And you'll find that as you do the search, it's not going to turn out the way you had thought or hoped right away. I mean, <laughs> okay. you, might look, you might look at 10 different keywords before you find your one or two that you should be targeting. Okay. Is there a target sales rank that you're looking for? Or is there just like, a, well, this is my area of expertise. Like I'm the skydiving guy. I couldn't write the book about prayer. You know, is there right. trying to find a sweet spot to validate this idea or is like, Hey, the book is already written. And you know, now I'm trying to figure out what best to title it or subtitle it. Right. And actually I would do it with titling or subtitling because basically I like to do what they call writing to market. Now I don't make the whole book about what everybody wants to read. I try to start with what they want to read and then turn that story or whatever it is in the direction of what I wanted to write in the first place so that I can write what I'm passionate about. They can hear what they need to hear with what they want to hear. Or if it's in fiction, they're getting what they want to read. And with fiction, it may be less important than with nonfiction. Because with skydiving, you might have safety tips that you absolutely need to tell them. <laughs> okay. And they don't want to hear it. They just want to hear about the thrill of jumping out of a plane or something. But you start with those areas. And you'll notice them on the bestseller lists, the kinds of titles that you see up there. What are they doing in their description and in their titles, do you notice any keyword phrases that they all seem to be targeting? 
that should be something that you're targeting as well. Okay. Follow the leader, see what the top sellers are doing. Right. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Okay. As long as you can be your own work and put your own unique spin on it. Right. I noticed that a lot of your books are at 99 cents. And I know that that only gives you a 35% royalty on Amazon. So I'm curious about your pricing strategy. Yeah, well, my genre is extremely highly competitive. So in order to stay on top, you cannot get a book in religion. If you are self-published, you cannot get it to work at above $2.99. And even at $2.99, at this time of year, things tend to slip. So I might price a few of them a little higher at a different time of year. But I generally try to keep things lower in my genre. And the reason also is, is because you're trying to make money off of more than just your eBooks. It helps bring visibility to your paperbacks and it helps bring visibility to your audiobooks. And I use a similar launch strategy. I launch my audiobooks when I do make them at the same time that I launch my eBooks because that brings visibility to the audiobook and grows its rankings on the algorithm so that I end up selling more of those than I would have if I just put it out there. And so I end up making more money across the spectrum. But I don't recommend this strategy for everyone in every genre at all, because in some other genres, let's say sci-fi, for example, starting out, you could easily have your book at similar rankings as I do at $2.99 or $3.99 because it's less competitive. I'm just focusing on what I'm passionate about. But I mean, if you know already what you want to write, you want to write a sci-fi, for example, and you're focusing on a market that has less competition, but a lot of buyers, you can keep your prices higher, just like supply and demand. It's interesting because in the KDP dashboard, in your author dashboard, Amazon has introduced this like sliding scale, like price optimizer tool, which is really cool to look at. And their goal is obviously to maximize revenue. My curious thing about it is whether or not, yeah, you could potentially earn more royalties at a higher price point, but like at what cost, right? So you're talking about, oh, I could probably make more initially at this price point, but that's going to hurt my sales rank. And then maybe I fall off the visibility wagon. And like, it's a weird ebb and flow on that. Have you played around with that too a little? I have tried it with a few books and I have not found it to be helpful for myself. <laughs> And it's just like you said, when you raise your prices, again, I'm not saying everybody should be at 99 cents. It's my genre. It's just, it's so highly competitive. In other genres, I have other pen names, for example, where I've written in romance. Those books are $2.99. And if you've got a bigger audience, you can easily put it at $5.99 because, I mean, you have a big audience. They're looking for you already. Okay. So I don't want anyone to be discouraged by that. But the truth is in it that you need to focus on what helps you get the most visibility. And if that's at $2.99, by all means, do price your book at that. For me, that is at $0.99. Cents. And if I begin raising the prices to above $2.99, I find myself to struggle with visibility. And as a result, I fall off the sales rank. I lose all my income. Your goal is not necessarily the dollars. Your goal should be how many people are actually looking at your book. You bring up a good point. What are you doing with people looking at your book and trying to funnel them into your own ecosystem, into your own brand? Basically, I break it down into two separate categories that works for any online business. It works the same for books. It's traffic and conversions. You want to have your own source of traffic that you can control, such as an email list, your social media platforms, your blog, podcast, I mean, whatever it is that you have out there. But when it comes to books, email lists are the strong force there. Okay. On the conversion factors, you want to focus on the things that trigger them to buy. And that begins with your cover, because that's the first thing that they see when they open up the page on Amazon or anywhere else. The first thing they see is the cover, then they notice the title. So you want it to be an eye candy cover. You want the title to grab your target audience somehow. It just needs to speak to them in some way. And then they will click on it. And the next thing they'll do is they'll read that description some of them will buy at that time. Others may say, I want to know more. So they'll open up the sample, the look inside feature for Amazon. And you want to also make that just, I have a formula that I use on that. I try to hook them within the first sentence or the first paragraph, then at the end of the first chapter and at the end of the look inside feature, whatever that might be, because they're getting hooked into this story and it leaves them hanging with enough burning desire to want to know what happens next or what they could learn next so that the only way that they'll know, it forces them to go ahead and click that button and buy your book. Okay. Do they still do a roughly 10% of the manuscript in the preview, in the look inside preview? Yes. Okay. So you can kind of get an estimate of where they're going to cut that off in your book and mentally 
pack that with some good stuff. Now, do you right, do the right. traditional thing of like putting an opt-in offer, putting like a reader bonus or something in those first few pages that people can see for free? Oh, yes, absolutely. Like I was saying, you want to have your own source of traffic. So what I do to build my email list is I put links at the front of my book. Traditional advice suggests to put it at the end of the book, but I find this to be a poor place to put it because most of your visibility is coming from the front. Some people, if you have a long novel, will only read halfway through. Life gets in the way. They've got children, TV, movies, other things to distract them. So they might never even finish the book, so they won't find that link to draw them to your email list. So by putting it in the front, you're also getting free traffic from Amazon. People who look into your book and decide not to buy, they'll close your book, they'll move on, they'll forget about you and never buy from you again. But these people will see in the Look Inside feature that opt-in offer for your lead magnet to get them onto your email list. So they'll see, hey, that's a free book there. Everybody loves a free book. So if they don't buy today, you'll be able to get them on your email list and sell to them again and again tomorrow. So that lost sale can turn into many sales that way in the future. There's always a chance. I like that one. Do you enroll your books in the KDP Select program? I do. I used to be wide a long time ago, and I found some good success in it. But when the Kindle Unlimited platform had come out, I decided to kind of go all in. Plus, when you have a lot of titles like I do, some of them in the series start getting titled a little bit similarly. And as a result, Amazon would confuse two of the titles and they say, hey, you're supposed to be select with this one. And I'll say, well, no, it's a completely different one. Then they'll take my books off of select and it ends up damaging my royalties. So I decided, you know what, I'll just go all in and we'll see what happens. And it turned out to be for the better. So, so you're getting paid on, I guess, go through the main advantages of the exclusivity program. Right. Well, with exclusivity, you can do the free select days. Now, it's hard to get visibility nowadays for that, but if you go to different book promotion websites, different book blogs, there's free booksy, it's free books with a Y.com. They give you thousands of downloads just for one ad with them. There are other big places like 100 free books, Book Gorilla, Book Sense, Kindle Nation Daily, all these huge websites that will send you thousands and thousands of downloads. Plus, as you build your email list, you can also get more. So the basic strategy with that is on your first day, you want to, it works the same as the algorithm used to. You want to pump as many sales into the first day, then prop your ranks over time because they don't give you as much visibility. And it also helps you gain more visibility in the end, just the way the algorithm works. Okay. We'll get into a kind of a dummy walkthrough of a launch or maybe an actual launch uh, strategy that she's done recently. I'm curious on the list building, generating these email subscribers, how many on your list right now? From Amazon, I have nearly 10,000 and I've got, wow. I try to focus on free strategies to get my, my subscribers. I have a really cool tactic that I use with KDP Select where I'll write a short story or something small like that for the purpose of getting email subscribers and then I'll launch it to get them. And then in the end, that book ends up paying me. So I get paid to get email subscribers versus paying Facebook for them. So this kind of just a little hack that I use there that slow down, slow down. How does that work? <laughs> well, basically it might be a book that I may not have originally have written, but I would write like a short story. And what I do, if I'm going to write, let's talk about fiction. Let's say if I'm going to write a fictional series, you don't just want to write a novel first. It'll take you months and you get it done, you get it out there and you might find that it doesn't take well on the market. So what I do is I'll write a short story around an idea. I'll put it out there and put it in KDP Select free to give it more visibility. And during that launch, I can get a few hundred email subscribers. Then that book goes back to paid. Because inside the book, you're giving away something for free in exchange for email. Exactly. And I put that link in the front of my book so everyone sees it when it hits the top of the charts. Okay. And using the five free KDP so like promo days and then using these free promo sites to pump up some traffic to it. Right. Okay. Exactly. And also using my own email list. So then I'll build an email list like that. And then if it does well on the algorithm, people seem to like it, then I'll go ahead and I'll make the series. But if it does not do well, I'll move on to the next idea and make a short story around that until I find the idea that's working. And it saves me more time so I can focus on the 80-20, you know, the 20% that's working versus spending a lot of time on things that I could hope would work. And in the process, I'm getting email subscribers for my next major launch. Yeah, an interesting way to validate. And so I'm getting the impression that for the people who are already on your list, occasionally they're getting these free promos. I'm curious, what kind of content are you sending out? Are you also maintaining a blog in addition to all this book writing? Or is it just, you know, get my next book? Right. Well, I haven't really had time to 
to <laughs> take care of a blog. So I didn't really go that route. I didn't know how to drive traffic. So I focused on what I did know and what I was learning. And I was using Amazon to drive the traffic through those free books okay. to my pages. But anyway, so to answer your question on my email list, what I focused on is just randomly giving them another free book and letting them know about it. I found that it helps increase my open rates because through time or over time, I should say, if you, if you're constantly selling to them, Hey, buy this 99 cent book, buy this two ninety nine, buy, buy, buy. And then people get sick of hearing that. Yeah. They want to know what's in it for them. So if you're going to be on my list, I'm going to give you something free every once in a while to make sure that everybody's happy. Sure. Okay. How often are you emailing them? I don't email them as often as I had used to. I used to do it on a bi-monthly basis. Now I might do it, let's say, monthly or so, just because I focused on other things now. So if I'm not putting out a book, because this year I haven't put many out, I do other things like a giveaway. And giveaways, they like that. That helps my open rates because they all get a chance to get something free. But then they start letting their friends and family know about it. And that brings other people onto my list as well. Okay, a little viral element there. Right. All right. I know, I guess it's been a while. You've been letting the portfolio ride a little bit this year, which is awesome. That's the passive income portion of, of, you know, creating all these assets. Right. Can you walk me through a launch? You know, I've got a launch coming up very, very soon and trying to figure out the best way to go about it. So maybe something uh, that you found that works well. Sure. My last launch was in mid-July and that one I did was for a free book. And normally I do like to do, if I do an individual title, especially if it's an old one, I do what's called price pumping. And to put it in short, I just like to promote it at 99 cents and push it up. Even if it's, you know, for my pen name and it's $2.99, I'll put it down to 99 cents, put it on sale, and I'll try to push it up through some book blogs and such. But without going into that, my last promotion, I decided to do it for free. And I hit up my email list, put as many of these large book blogs as I could on day one. And with my email list now, because it's much larger, that included with my Facebook and everything else, with those book promotions on day one, I had gotten roughly 38,000 downloads. Wow. And then from there, that gives you the biggest spike of visibility on the free algorithm. It does not work that way anymore on the paid algorithm. And that's, that's another story for another day, but they changed the way the algorithm works there. So you have to do the reverse where you trickle and do a boil up until you burst at the end. 38,000 downloads in one day, that had to have been top 50 in the entire Amazon store. I hit number two in the store. Yeah, I was going to say that's, yeah, that's a lot of volume. (laughs) Yeah, I was hoping and aiming for number one, but I ended up hitting number two and I held on to that for a few days. And I continued to get about 12,000 downloads over the next few days for that launch. Wow. As I propped those ranks, like I said, so altogether I had roughly 50,000 downloads for that. Okay. And you're getting email subscribers off of this effort, but did that translate into any paid sales afterwards? Oh, yes, it did. That book, when it went to paid, at first it hit the top thousand, but then the visibility really kicked in. And for about a week or two, it stayed in the top 400 in the store. Wow. I had spent, I don't have the exact number, but I had done the math and it was several hundred dollars in promotion websites and things. But by my second week, by the end of it, it was completely all paid back to me from just that book promotion alone, not including all of the paperback sales I started to get. That week that I promoted, that's just part of the power that people need to understand. I had done 300 paperbacks above normal for that promotion period. And that ended up translating into August being double the amount of paperbacks that I ordinarily sell because everything was able to boost onto the algorithm that way. Okay. Wow. Okay. So you did a bunch of paid promos for the free launch and then you kind of did a second wave for the 99 cent effort? No, no. I just let it go to paid and just kind of left it at that. And it, the algorithm took it by itself and just, just held it up for a couple months in the top 1000, 2000. And of course it's drifted down now. Okay. But that's just something you expect through time. And later you do another promotion and you just continue to do this through time. Okay. So that's kind of a way to breathe new life into archive titles saying, okay, it's it's due for a, due for a promo. You hook up with one of these book sends or book, was it Kindle gorilla? (laughs) You mentioned like three of them, like really fast. Sorry. There's book gorilla, Kindle nation daily book sends. There's so many out there that can get you a lot of visibility. Okay. Those ones are some of your favorites, like where that you found worthwhile to do their paid promo. Oh, yes. I have almost always made my money back with them and then some through time. 
All right. So what happened next after this thing? It rides out on the paid charts and now it's out there. It's making money for you. Right. Well, my audio had picked up, my paperbacks picked up, but over time, my ebook sales rank slowly slipped down. I think, I don't even know what I'm at now. It's probably back down to 15,000 or 20,000. And that's typical. But before my promotion, it was sitting at 100,000 in the store. So, I mean, it's still riding that wave out. Yeah. If I'm taking anything away, it's to have your paperback and your audio ready to go, which means I need to get my button gear on the audiobook. And it's surprising, like my best-selling create space title, my best-selling paperback title this year has been for a book that's on permafree on Amazon. Like you can, you can download the ebook for free. That was really surprising to me. There's kind of a shadow demand for paperback. So that's been a pretty good, I guess, a surprising uh, passive income stream. Yeah. And that was a trick that I used to apply. I would have things at permafree and it would raise the rankings of my audio and my paperback. But over time as I began losing visibility for the free. I, I decided I need to have more income than this. So I put some of them back to 99 cents to compensate. Do you do a create space for the paperbacks as well? Oh, yes. Okay. Would you ever go traditionally published now that you have kind of this audience in this platform? Or do you say, hey, I have the audience in the platform. I don't need to. Well, I don't know. I've considered it. I've been contacted by a lot of different publishers, Harper Collins, Thomas Nelson. There was... Even even foreign rights, just recently I was contacted for one of my best-selling books. I'm trying to remember what nation, South Korea it was. But okay. <laughs> what ended up happening is I just felt as if what they were offering wasn't appropriate because I know from experience I'm able to touch more lives doing it this way and I'm able to have a better income. So if I can get a reasonable deal, then yes, I would absolutely go publish. I have no issue with that at all. What else is working? Anything else that we should know on, you know, hitting the top of the charts on a new release? Yeah, again, doing a 99 cent promo. If you start with a slow boil at first, I haven't done one in a long time. Last time I did, well, actually, I've done it with a couple of my other titles, but one is coming to mind right now. It was under my name. It was a romance, damaged, broken, but healed by love. And Long story short, I started with a slow boil and then I ended with a spike at the end. And the reason that works is Amazon put a buffer on their algorithm to stop launch companies from helping. There's these shady companies that will give you fake reviews and then let you buy your own books or spatulas or whatever to get you falsely on the rankings. And so they tried to curb that by changing how the algorithm worked. So with people who are legitimately doing it, you can hit your audience up or other promotion sites to create a slow boil at first. And then at the end of, let's say, a four or five day period, you hit all of your lists up, everything. And when you spike up to the top, you're able to make you know more sales that way. For me, I was able to hit the top 400 in the store with that one book. It ended up coming, I think, to the top 200, and I began outselling a book at that time that was on the New York Times, and it was experiencing a huge, huge burst of sales from a movie they made. So, Wow. Well, Adam, what's next for you? So you got this pretty extensive portfolio business. Are there more books on the horizon, or are you kind of pivoting to new side hustles? Well, I'm doing a little bit of both. I have a couple books in mind, but I'm just I'm taking it a little slower at this time because I'm able to focus more on a large launch to get more from it and it brings my visibility up so it gives me a lot of free time so with my free time i've done some other little side you know hustles i guess you could say i have uh, little stores where i sell children's books now and i mean that one does pretty well and i decided that i want to share this information with the rest of the world wait little stores like like a physical store or like a, an amazon store no 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 none of that it's actually <laughs> it's an internet store and i put it together as a subscription service where I'm selling children's books to, you know, mothers and parents who want to help grow their children's reading. Oh, cool. What's the domain for that? Plug it away. Sure. It's lilbearbookclub.com. And it's doing very well. I like putting occasionally a signed copy from one of the authors. One of the times we were able to get a signed copy from the guy who does Pete the Cat. Okay. I love my white shoes. I know Pete the Cat. <laughs> and I am... Hoping and anticipating, I'm working with Harper Collins right now. They are the ones who publish his books. So I might be able to get another one in there in the coming months here. But long story short, it's just made for children to help them with their reading and encourage them with little gifts that we hand wrap of books to just kind of encourage the reading process to help them grow with that. 
Well, sounds good. And you got the fanbaseformula.com where you're kind of walking people through some of the self-publishing lessons learned through the ups and downs of, of 100 different book launches. You are an entrepreneur at heart. I love it. All these different hustles going on. Very cool, Adam. Thanks so much. Let's check him out at thefanbaseformula.com and we'll wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Focus on building yourself an audience because once you have your audience, you'll be able to take control of your future, whatever it is, whatever business it is, you'll always be able to send those people to your sales page and continue to have an income. Absolutely. I found it to be true and hopefully can continue to find it to be true. So Adam, thanks so much for joining me and we'll catch up with you soon. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is brought to you by designcrowd.com. I just tested out their crowdsourced design marketplace myself for the cover of the Buy Buttons book. I ended up getting 35 or 40 submissions from 13 different designers all around the world, and the winning designer was actually from Indonesia. It was really cool. I really liked her her cover concept, and we were able to message back and forth to test out different color variations, different image variations. She was probably getting sick of hearing me for the end. Hey, can we just see what, is, what does it look like in orange? But it ended up being her first design crowd win. So I was excited to support a likely side hustler on that platform as well. She put her buy button up there and I bought it. I also used design crowds voting feature to get some initial, some initial feedback from my launch team, which was helpful and, and actually surprising in a lot of ways. Um, the one that was the cover that was my front runner was not the most well received. So I was glad I asked for that feedback. Um, design crowd also has a money back guarantee. If you don't like any of the designs, you can get a full refund. Now, thankfully I didn't have to invoke that, but the option is there. If you're on the fence, if you want to see the winning cover, check out buybuttonsbook.com and to start a design project of your own for a logo, a book cover, uh, a package design, visit designcrowd.com slash hustle or use promo code hustle to get up to a hundred dollars off. That's designcrowd.com slash hustle for up to $100 off your next design project. All right, my top takeaways from this call with Adam. Number one, write to spread a message first and to earn money second. Now, clearly, Adam has a lot to say on the topics he writes about and has become more strategic on the business side of writing as he's gone about it, but it started just as something he wanted to put out into the world. Takeaway number two is to think of Amazon as a search engine and your book page as your website. What keywords are people going to search for? What keywords should people search to find you? How can you incorporate those into your cover, your title, your subtitle, your description? How can you maximize conversions on your book page? Now, Amazon gives you a lot of the pieces of the puzzle. Like it's a template that you just have to kind of fill in in the blanks for. So take a look at some of Adam's titles uh, to see how he has his pages set up for conversions. And takeaway number three, if you don't have a big email list, you can buy access to big email lists pretty affordably through some of the promotion sites that Adam mentioned. And I'm going to link those up in the show notes for you at sidehustlenation.com slash Adam. And I'm, and I'm actually testing out a few of those services this week for the book launch, uh, for my book launch of Buy Buttons. So I'm curious to see how those play out and if they're able to drive some incremental sales. We'll see. I'll report back on all that stuff. If you want to take a deeper dive into the Kindle world, definitely check out Adam's site at the fanbaseformula.com slash side hustle. He's got a, some, some pretty cool free Kindle training videos over there that you might like for, for side hustlers. Again, that's the fanbaseformula.com slash side hustle. Notes and links for this episode, plus a free PDF highlight reel of the conversation are at sidehustlenation.com slash Adam. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 